So uh, th thank you both. Uh, one of the questions that has uh, come up, and I wouldn't say has plagued, but that we've uh, considered over and over again uh, has to do with uh, what are the data? Uh, are they the data that were reported in an article, or are the data that you feel should be available the entirety of the data set, some subset of data uh, beyond that that was originally reported? Um, what do you feel you need in order to be able to uh, review adequately? And uh, implicit in this is that you would uh, also need the metadata so that you could understand uh, what information you had been given. So I'll give both of you a chance uh, to respond. So I uh, made a slide actually of 16 types of data for that reason and the way what guided me in preparing that slide was the thought uh, it's on the slide too so you can refer to it but it's what of these types of data do we need to credibly assess a trial and I don't think that that can be done with a publication there's too great of a degree of trust that's involved given the history I think now that to rely on publications is not a good way to do a credible independent analysis. So my answer is that the, the guiding question is what do you need to credibly independently assess a trial? You need a huge amount. It's not just numerical data. It's, it's also your analyses. It's the narratives that go with the data. It's the judgments that were made along the process of doing that trial. Sometimes it's correspondence that occurred amongst the trialists that really gives that third party enough information to understand what happened in the adjudication of that event. All right, so um, I think we're in violent agreement, so it's in, important to uh, rephrase my question a little bit. Uh, well, you and, want to disagree? No, I, oh, no okay. I said we were in violent agreement. Uh, right. <laughs> when, you, when you publish an article, there are the data that went into making up the figures and tables and the narrative conclusions in that article. And I agree with you that besides the raw data, there were many decisions that had to be made about which numbers were included and which weren't. And having uh, done clinical trials and uh, had to sit in that seat, you make lots and lots of decisions that are either not documented or are not uh, extensively documented. Uh, what I was asking was slightly different. Uh, Suppose you had that set of information that led to the conclusions drawn in an article. Do you feel that you need to have data beyond what was in the article other than the data that were needed to narrow the set from what was included in the analysis set beyond? So for example, suppose you're doing a high blood pressure trial and your primary outcome has to do with blood pressure to given length of time uh, after treatment was started and along the way you collected uh, aldosterone levels uh, which are not reported in the paper. Uh, do you believe that having access to that information is critical or it could wait until a time when the people who collected the primary data had published their aldosterone paper which was not necessarily part of that first paper. So that was uh, what I was trying to say. I'm looking not at the uh, decisions that led from the raw data to the analytical data set, but rather to the section of the analytical data set that was reported. Right. Uh, it's a tricky question. If, if those outcomes that you're proposing are really secondary and not directly relevant to the drug, I can see, or to the published outcomes, I can see a, a period of time in which the original uh, trialists have primacy to that data. There is the risk, though, uh, that you are including things that affect the, the safety and effectiveness of the drug. And so Excluding it, things or including things? Sorry. Well, in, sure in the secondary you. outcomes, there's the assumption that that doesn't bear at all in what the, what the public needs to know about safety and effectiveness of the drug. And if you can make that assurance, I suppose it's okay. But my worry is harms data, for example, fit in this category of, in some ways, they're not pre-specified. They're very exploratory and secondary. You're just collecting data. 
And so one could argue that one doesn't have to present all that data, and it never is. It doesn't fit in a publication. We don't have extremely good or, uh, standards on how to report those data. That that would also be an example of the type of data one doesn't need to report. And in that case, I would say, no, that does need to be uh, reported and shared. So I, I think I agree. It depends on the case, uh, the particular circumstances. But I do think there is a role for, uh, for delaying uh, sharing of certain data. So if I were to summarize what you said, I want to make sure that I'm saying it correctly. Um, we would have uh, the data that were used to generate the figures and tables presented. And perhaps you would like to have on top of this uh, a large fraction, if not the entire adverse event database, so that you would have both the efficacy and the adverse events available, even though all those adverse events may have been summarized in the paper, they may not have been reported in detail. Did I? More or less, but I think part of the, the assumption here is that we're dealing with electronic data sets where you can just sort of hold certain variables from dissemination. But what if you're dealing with more paper documents and reports like the clinical study report where you have lots of things that are mixed in and so it's a little bit harder to separate these. Where you have a protocol, for example, the study protocol, which would reveal the existence of these outcomes. I mean, there, there's, a, I think, going to be an extent to which you can hold back data. Okay. John? So I, I think that it depends on what the application would be. If it's a reproducibility check, probably there is uh, some leeway to ask for less information compared to if you really want to have the open opportunity to use these data for other purposes. So it could be extended analysis, integrating them with other trials uh, that have pertinent information. And my preference would be to move from level one, as uh, Peter showed, to uh, level 16. Uh, and any compromise in, in the middle ground will have to take into account that uh, it leaves some window of opportunity for bias. So if any processing of the data, unless you can really tell how it happened and can verify that it did not introduce bias, I, I will never feel safe enough, even though I may become a little paranoid. Uh, a process data set has lots of input that is very difficult to discern. So, so it, I can give you an, one example that maybe I, I get all the data that went to the figures and to the tables and they look perfect and, and I can reproduce exactly the tables and the figures. This doesn't say much in, in terms of, of how was that data set generated from the raw data set that was originally collected in, in study reports. So uh, there, there may, be, may be many steps in in the processing that could have affected what I, I get eventually uh, presented in, in a paper. Do you want to reread the chest x-rays and the EKGs, uh, the, so, the biopsies? Um, it may sound uh, extreme. Uh, in selected cases, uh, one may even have to end up going to that level. Uh, I think it's going to be the exception. Um, but you can easily think of uh, a trial that's unblinded uh, that uh, people who assess these x-rays or the biopsies uh, are clearly conflicted with uh, reading, that it's a biopsy or, biopsy or an x-ray that is not a standard um, non-subjective outcome, but it's something that's really dependent on the operator and the reader. And uh, uh, the effect could really go both sides depending on who read it and why and how. In that case, I might argue, even though I have exactly every detail about the readings, th there's still some possibility that something might have been biased in the assessment. I'm not saying, though, that this is the, the rule. I think that most types of measurement, one doesn't need to go so deeply. That would be probably not even uh, level 16. It would be level 17. I, I think in 98% in of the trials, probably that's not necessary because the the measurements don't have this level of subjectivity and, and ability to distort the result based on whatever bias might exist. i change subjects just a little bit. One of the things that we've tossed around in, in our internal discussions is the extent to which the primary investigators, the people who conceived the trial idea, uh, went out and recruited the patients, uh, did the intervention, gathered the uh, efficacy and adverse event data, uh, and then they publish something. Did they have right to a period of exclusivity knowing that uh, they can't report everything 
at the beginning. Uh, it just it would be too much to digest. So they report what they think is most critical. Do they have a right to sit on the data for some period of time while they get the rest of the stuff straight in their heads? Or do you believe that they have uh, an obligation to make uh, the data available immediately on publication, even if it's just a redacted subset of what led to that primary publication? Okay. So... Um I, I think that this is something that needs to be uh, agreed and agreed on, on a wide enough basis that there will not be any misunderstandings about it. My personal opinion is that they should be uh, allowed to have some advantage. So, you know, as you said, they put effort into this, they did design the trial, they worked on it sometimes maybe for years, and it's not easy to really exploit everything that they can do. Um, uh, immediately. Uh, usually someone has additional analysis, secondary analysis, or sub-projects that are in, in the works. Um, I think that transparency would help. So if, if there is uh, really transparency on what are the analysis that have been planned, including the secondary analysis and sub-projects and anything else, uh, this immediately will give some sort of primacy that uh, these authors are working on that. So whoever is coming now to use these data should try to do something else, or, or uh, at least uh, not uh, uh, have redundant efforts unless it's a reproducibility check on, on what is being done. Um, so a, a little bit of, of an advantage time-wise, probably it's, it's worth it, but that, that shouldn't really detract from the principle that uh, that information should become widely available. And to a large extent, when it does become available, there should be a mechanism that the original investigators could also be rewarded for what they did. So um, as I showed you empirically, until now, almost always there are co-authors in the papers that come out from these reanalysis or secondary analysis. Um, I'm not sure that they need to be co-authors. Uh, they are co-authors because currently the coinage for academic promotion and everything and getting grants is a publication. We'll Talking about that later today. But if, if they get some credit that they are the originators of the data set and, and that counts, uh, that, that would be very important. I don't have a, a ton more to add. I'm in general agreement. I think one thing to grapple with, though, are arbitrary uh, deadlines, like one year is all you need to do it. I think this can be highly variable and dependent, and for some people it's not enough. Um, so you need a, some kind of metric that's more fluid and reacts to that reality, such as are the people still working on it. Now I realize these are much harder to enforce and to measure, but you need something I think that responds both to the issue that there is primacy of the, those who uh, did the study and that they're best equipped to report on the study that they conducted, and also the problem of publication bias and the non-reporting. Uh, when it becomes intentional or it's simply laziness or something like that. So some middle ground. I, I tried my hand at this with this concept of trial abandonment, which has to do with when uh, study authors or sponsors are no longer actively pursuing publication of that data. Then I think that a trial is abandoned and somebody else needs to be able to uh, report on that trial with the data. So my final question before we open it up to the uh, committee in general, is that uh, what, what's your experience been uh, individually uh, with going to authors and asking for access to data sets? One of the ways, obviously, is not to have anything from above, but you say, gee, it was a great paper you read, and I have a question, and I'd like to see the data. Uh, do you find that you're uh, welcome with open arms, that uh, that there are many barriers put between you and the data, or that um, there's something in between. What, what's your, been your general experience, and has there been a difference between trials that have been sponsored by governmental entities, such as the NIH Foundation, such as the Gates or Wellcome Trust, and industry? So uh, my experience has been mixed, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just focusing on clinical trials and randomized controlled trials, because obviously it's a very different beast uh, in epidemiology, genomics, where there's far more openness currently. Um, there are some cases where investigators have been very willing to participate. I think that um, endeavors where they're asked to be co-authored al also, uh, probably they have even an extra uh, incentive to do that. Uh, but even, uh, even without that, if it's limited information that one is asking for, usually you, you get an answer. If you want to probe a little further, though, um, it's more difficult. So if, if uh, the request is, can I get three numbers on these outcomes that are not clear uh, based on the published paper? 
this is easier to, to get. If you ask for individual level information, row data, um, this is probably not easy. So you get lots of negative responses, or even you get lots of responses that I don't have the data. I've seen that again and again, both for industry-sponsored trials and for academic-sponsored uh, trials. Uh, within very limited period of time, data disappear. Uh, and uh, e even organizations that have a strong tradition in clinical trials research, um, I've asked for data from uh, big companies, and, and I want to believe them that they don't have the data. They don't know where they are and what has happened to, uh, to the data in the meanwhile. And this could be like a few years after the publication of the paper. I don't, I don't want to become paranoid that they're just tr trying to hide something. Um, so why is that? Probably because there's not a culture of data sharing. So the, the data set is something that is consumable. It is consumed when the paper is published, and then it can well disappear. Yeah, with, with industries, I mean, I don't have the history of John here to reflect on, but in my experience, we haven't been able to get data through named authors on publications. Uh, this, for some observational studies, uh, we have, but in no case to, that I remember has this ever been easy or quick. Uh, with the Roche Tamiflu trials, uh, every single, there was only two of the ten trials I showed, only two were published. Those two authors of the published trials both sent us to Roche uh, to access data. They did not have the data. They actually hadn't analyzed the data themselves either. So they also said that. So you, you, don't, you don't get data from authors in general. And the panel, Joanne? Um, I know we've, we've talked about um, publication bias. And uh, I was just curious, what can we do to avoid publication bias as we go forward, right? We have some time before this is probably going to all be done in a much broader way. I have a feeling that when investigators verify data, and if they actually verify the results, it's not going to be very interesting for journals like Jeff's journal to publish and say, here are the data. We've re reanalyzed this study, and it's exactly the same. I have a feeling it's not going to be too exciting versus publishing something that says we've analyzed these data and we find exactly the opposite results. And I have a feeling those will be published in, you know, top-tier journals and get a lot of media. So I'm, I'm just trying to be proactive and try to ask what do you think we can do both from the publication bias perspective and then something that you brought up, Dr. Doshi, which was the, the journalism perspective. Can we do something proactively, think about it now? Sure. For, I mean, from the journalism perspective, uh, I think we have a, a lot of work to do in involving journalists in this process, in improving understanding of study design, in improving the difference between prospective, retrospective, exploratory analyses. I think a lot of it has to do with education. The data sharing component, my personal vision about how that can influence journalism is we can set a new standard for publication, such that publication with data inherently has more weight than publication with no data, Pu trust me, publications. Uh, so those are all areas I think journalism can help. Uh, in terms of reanalyses, uh, if a reanalysis confirms the original analysis, these days we have, I think, good mechanisms for at least putting some kind of note in the record that that happened. I mean, we have feedback mechanisms with journals. I mean, I think there are ways that we can handle that. It's not as important as an analysis, I think, that refutes the original. Why? Because the, ref the refutation shows that there was a problem in the scientific literature, and the refutation hopefully allows us to improve and correct the scientific literature, whereas the confirmation doesn't improve our course. Uh, I think that I would like to see more reanalysis. So um, I understand that there will be probably a period of uh, misunderstandings and, and people may be trying to make bold claims of, uh, oh, here I refuted that mega trial that uh, was the, the gold standard for half of medical care in, in my discipline. But if there's transparency, people would be very quick to see that that quote-unquote refutation uh, was based on some completely erroneous premises about how the analysis should be done or how uh, outcomes were assessed and analyzed. So um, I think if there's transparency for the original publications and there's equal transparency for the reanalysis, people would be able to tell uh, that this is most likely to be correct and this is most likely to be wrong. Um, I, I don't think that people will 
probably go after making these splash claims all the time. I think that if we have a culture that uh, respects the reanalysis for its own merit, even if it's confirmatory, um, people would be happy just to report that I did confirm that. Uh, there's many examples uh, in many other fields, like uh, the reproducibility initiative currently is trying to reproduce the most highly cited papers in cell biology, and PLOS One has agreed that it will publish all the reproducibility efforts, uh, regardless of what the results they get. So obviously, these reanalyses are not going to, to go to Jeff, but <laughs> I think that there will be some journal that will have an opportunity to present them in a transparent way and uh, reinforce or weaken the, the ori original message. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts, first of all, on vehicles other than journals to um, publish and post um, reanalyses, because they, they may not rise to the level of justifying a quote-unquote journal publication, but as we know, the, the, what the electronic publishing landscape is becoming more and more uh, diverse and uh, as as we go, so I'd, I'd be interested if you know of examples, or whether you think it's a good idea that we develop some sort of parallel or complementary system. Maybe you could even build on PubMed Commons or something like that. Um, that's the first question. The second is just a comment on the issue of journalism. Um, you know, there, there are many forces that affect uh, journalists, and 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 we we're seeing that science reporters. Basically, science reporters are a vanishing breed for the most part. They're a very, very small cadre of them. And most people report science, uh, do it as part of a regular beat. And uh, I actually think it's, it's, we can always hope to educate them more. But um, uh, that expertise is not actually valued for the most part by the major uh, journalistic out outlets. Uh, one of the best medical science reporters in the country was just cut by the Washington Post just as a cost-cutting measure. Um, and it just, you know, it wasn't worth it. He took, you know, two to three weeks or a month to write a, you know, terrific article and, you know, that, that isn't cost-effective. So we get people who, who cover, you know, shootings on the one hand and science on the other and uh, this is a problem for journalism in, in general. Um, and they, they don't even have the time to be, to go to conferences. I mean, they're, they're, they're jur magazines and journals don't want to send them because they, they can't afford it. Uh, so I, I think we have to look for, it, it's a great goal uh, to educate them, but it's a constant, huge turnover and the forces of journalism are, are fighting against us. But anyway, on the first issue, um, what do you see as other models for how we, how we might have outlets for alternative analyses, which, uh, and I don't know that we should privilege, you know, the refutation, even call it a refutation, because it may be that the first analysis was the right one. So John is right, you know, you, you still have to be able to look at both and fairly assess them. So are there, are there, do we need other vehicles other than, than quote unquote journals or, 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 or is a lot of the open, open journals uh, adequate? I, I think that proposal uh, is out there that we really need to get away from this concept of trials being published in journals and, uh, and I support that. I don't think it can be done overnight, so I like the suggestion of a parallel track approach where we start to build the infrastructure for doing that, the reward mechanisms for doing that. Uh, but so many of our current practices like guideline develop and systematic reviews are so hooked on journals that it's going to take some time to move out of that system. So I think we need to support both tracks par in parallel. What would that parallel track look like? The parallel, oh, uh, so it, it's, I think it's, con it's what you're suggesting, I thought, which is sort of construction of databases that can start to hold the results of clinical trials instead of uh, journal publications being the be-all and end-all of, uh, the, being called, even called the primary publication, I think is, is a problematic terminology because it's such a small sliver, it's such an extreme synthesis of all that happened in the trial. So, so one could think of many different uh, online parallel tracks. Uh, 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 for example, the results section in clinical trials gov is, is one such possibility. One can think of other resources or even clinical trials gov expanding to have a reanalysis uh, uh, section. Um, I, I think what is important is not exactly where it appears, but how transparent the process is and uh, whether one could see uh, how it was done, uh, was it reviewed, uh, how transparent the analytical path is, and uh, uh, therefore, 
to be in a position to judge w whether something was done in a fair way or in a very distorted way. But uh, I, I think we should experiment with these different possibilities. I, I, I don't think that journals will not be out there to publish reanalysis. I, <laughs> I think that there's so many journals out there that they will publish anything. Uh, so uh, reanalysis, especially reanalysis of uh, a randomized trial, I mean, sounds pretty attractive. I, I, I think there will be tens of thousands of journals who would want to, to get such papers. David, I'll give you the last word on this session. So the world that I've been living in a lot lately, it looks something like the following, a, a, a pivotal trial for big or small pharma, that doesn't seem to matter. So my group and, and others uh, have uh, been involved with monitoring the data during the trial. And typically, we will provide a final analysis because it's, it's just one more analysis. So that's one analysis. The sponsor will typically do analysis for their submission. That's analysis two. And the FDA will do their analysis. So we've got a trial, a pivotal trial going with, with three analyses, independent minded. In your assessment of the literature, is, in that setting, I, I, do you think that there's really something that's really been missed? Sure. I mean, it, it's not that there's something that's being missed or not. That's not the premise. I think the premise is, do you want to wor live in a world where there's independent fourth party uh, evaluation of information, evaluation of claims or not? I think that's the premise to start with. And if you do, then yes, we need to allow for an additional analysis. So out, out of the 20,000 trials uh, per year, uh, probably that triple uh, attack, <laughs> tri triple analytical attack, um, may pertain to 3% or 4% of the trials, probably no more than that. And, and I think even though these trials are very influential um, on their own, uh, in the big picture, it's the other 97% that really run the everyday type of medical care and, and decisions. Uh, so um, I'm not sure that we need three analyses routinely for every single trial of the, out of the 20,000. Uh, but I think that probably we need more. Uh, now, whether it could be done for every single one, um, all 20,000, be done twice, or it could be a random sampling of uh, uh, you are lucky or unlucky to be selected to have a reproducibility check, uh, uh, that's something to be decided. But uh, opening uh, data resources to do that, I, I think, will lead to a track that more of that is happening. Thank you very much, and I want to congratulate both of you for using the term data as a plural term. <laughs> <laughs>